A warning to our listeners, this series contains discussion of mental illness, addiction, and suicidal ideation. Let me ask you something. Did you ever feel like everything is broken and you're the only one who could fix it? Well, that's how my friend Barry Keenan was feeling back in 1963. Barry had problems, a bunch of them actually. He was broke, he was addicted to booze and pills, and his family was collapsing. Now, these problems don't make Barry special. I mean, they're the sort of problems that a lot of us have. What makes Barry special is the wild solution that he came up with to solve these problems. You see, Barry kidnapped Frank Sinatra Jr. Now, I think it's pretty likely a lot of you out there listening had no idea Frank Sinatra Jr. had been kidnapped. But it's true, he was. Back in 1963, the story splashed across front pages and saturated the airwaves. The Sinatra kidnapping. FBI agents search a house in the Canoga Park area of Los Angeles. The house, they say, where Frank Sinatra Jr. was held for ransom. Now, somehow it's faded over time. But when the opportunity to tell this story fell into my lap, I knew I had to tell it, because it is fascinating. Police set up roadblocks. The kidnappers, however, slipped the net and drove their victim to Los Angeles 400 miles away. Also, with the world the way it is today, I thought it might be nice to hear a true crime story with all the twists, turns, and intrigue we crave in our podcast cues, but without all the violent score and serial killers. No one died in this story, but no one really got out alive. I was scared, I was a little bit nervous naturally, but uh, the only thing I could do is hope for the best. A young heir to showbiz royalty never escaped the shadow of embarrassment. A nation's innocence was spoiled, and a mentally ill man's fantasies were dispelled. I was trying to get to heaven. And now, in his own words, for the first time, one of the greatest untold stories ever, the plot to kidnap Frank Sinatra Jr. was told to me by the guy who actually pulled it off. A 23-year-old unemployed salesman, Barry Keenan. I'm John Stamos, and this is The Grand Scheme, Snatching Sinatra. Now, you may be asking yourself, why is John Stamos, of all people, telling me the story of the kidnapping of Frank Sinatra Jr.? Well, that's sort of an interesting story in its own right. You see, as a kid growing up in Southern California, my favorite thing to do was drive around the neighborhood in my dad's El Camino. I'd get off work flipping burgers at our family restaurant, and I'd just spend hours driving up and down the streets lined with palm trees, just cruising and listening to early 60s surf music on my dad's 8-track. And sometimes it would be Little Lady from Pasadena or Dead Man's Curve by Jan and Dean. But my favorite record of all time was the Beach Boys' Endless Summer. That's what really got me turned on to surf music and the Beach Boys. Now, it turns out that Mike Love's parents lived just a few miles away from my parents. So I used to drive over there and I'd park my car outside and I would stare through the window into the living room and I'd see Mike Love's gold and platinum records. Surf at Safari, Surf in USA, Pet Sounds. And the singles, the 45s, you know, like Fun, Fun, Fun and Help Me Rhonda, wouldn't it be nice? I know it sounds simple, but moments like that, moments like that made it seem like anything was possible, that your dreams really could come true. And for me, they did. All right, so picture this. Fast forward to the early 80s. I'm on General Hospital, and I'm backstage at a Jan and Dean concert at the Orange County Fair. I'm sitting on a bale of hay, and to the left of me is the legendary Jan Berry. And to the right, Dean Torrance. And we're shoveling down funnel cakes at intermission. They actually asked me to come out and play on the encore with them, Bob Ran. <laughs> it was so cool. But anyway, I'm sort of in disbelief, right? I mean, I can remember practicing what I might say to these guys if I ever had a chance to meet them. But in this moment, Dean turns to me and he says, Hey, Stamos, I got something you might be interested in. It's, it's a story. See, this friend of mine... Back in the 60s, he kidnapped Frank Sinatra Jr. Dean told me that Barry grew up well off, upper middle class guy for sure. His dad was a stockbroker with a few celebrity clients in his Rolodex, and Barry went to school with their kids in the late 50s. So he spent some time around the golden era scene. But the key word there is around, as opposed to in. Because by 1963, Barry hadn't really found his path yet, his purpose. A lot of the kids that he'd grown up with had become just as rich and famous as their parents had, or even more so. They knew who they were, they knew what they wanted, and they knew how to get it. 
And Barry, he, he didn't know any of that. He wasn't sure what he was. Well, one thing's for sure, he wasn't lighting cigars at a table with the chairman of the board. He was just some mixed up kid who spent enough time on the edge of that world to get a whiff of how good that cigar smoke actually smelled. And despite the fact that he was drowning in all kinds of troubles those people never seemed to have, Barry wanted a seat at that table. Now look, fame is as much about talent as it is about catching a few lucky bounces. It's sort of like a pinball machine. It's this big labyrinth with bright lights and it's impossible to tell which path leads to the jackpot and which one will just send you bouncing off the walls. But the thing about Barry is that he doesn't care how many bad bounces it takes. He never takes his eye off the jackpot. Barry knew his seat at the big table wasn't going to come easy. But there's just something about him that makes people want to invite him to pull up a chair. And eventually, that's what he did to me. Now, it took me a few years to get around to it, but once I did, I called Barry and I invited him over to my house to tell me more. Just give me one more test, Barry. Test, one, two, three. Beautiful. See, I passed my screen test. <laughs> So here I was, sitting with a guy who actually pulled this thing off. He's at my house, he's eating this Cobb salad that he brought in this cute little lunchbox. And I wanted the whole thing. I wanted every detail, every plot twist, every goofy character that he conned along the way. And the more Barry talked, <laughs> the more my jaw dropped. And don't get me wrong, I'm not here to glorify what Barry did by any means. I'm a father now, and the thought of someone kidnapping my kid upsets me deeply. Still though, Barry's story really gets my wheels turning. I mean, we hear stories like this all the time. Grand schemes so bizarre you can't even believe they actually happen. But how often do you get to hear that kind of story directly from the guy who actually pulled it off? What on earth could make a person sink to that depth of desperation? And once they're down there, what convinces them that a harebrained scheme like this is the best way out of it? And for that matter, why would they repeatedly ignore the abundance of evidence that this was a terrible fucking plan? Well, those are the questions that intrigue me, and something tells me they may intrigue you as well. Over the next 10 episodes, that's exactly what you're going to hear. Barry Keenan's recollection of what it was like to be that guy. For the first time, his complete version of the entire plot to kidnap the son of one of the most famous men that ever lived, and save his own life in the process. It's a story about an imperfect man who tried to pull off the perfect crime. Exactly the way God told him to. Everything sort of turned bad at the same time. If I could just make one big hit, everything would be okay. That would cure everything. And uh, all of a sudden, God's voice came over my car radio, and the radio had been turned off. After the break, Chapter 1, God on the Radio. In the Catholic school, they taught us about hell and the suffering of hell, and the nuns said... It'd be like having a white hot poker on your back and screaming and nobody's going to be there to help you. And that's for eternity. In order to understand how this sweet old man with his cop salad and lunchbox was once the most wanted man in America, we've got to go all the way back to the late 40s. Back then, Barry was just five years old. He was in Catholic school having the living daylight scared out of him on a daily basis by the nuns. And that's when I obtained a... a uh morbid fear of going to hell because the nuns at the Catholic school made hell, uh, the picture of hell, something that was horrifying to a six and seven year old kid. Before long, he became so obsessed with salvation that he did something really drastic. I actually rode my bicycle into a busy intersection in hopes that if it was God's will, that I'd get run over and go straight to heaven. And I remember the people, the bystanders, who got out of their cars and helped lift me up and put me in her car, and I was bleeding like a pig from my leg. The woman who hit Barry jumped out of the car and scooped Barry into the backseat of her yellow Packard convertible. And she rushed me to my mother's house, which was about six blocks away, and uh, she uh, said, why did you do that? And I, in my shocked state, I said, I was trying to get to heaven. That image, the little boy who's so afraid that he's about to lose everything that he tries to find a shortcut to salvation. Hold on to that. 
Barry says he got the idea to ride his bike into traffic partly from the lectures he heard from the nuns at school and partly from his aunt, who lived with his family. My mother's older sister lived at our house to take care of my sick grandmother, who was dying of cancer. And so she facilitated and encouraged me with my Catholic religion because it seemed to uh, calm me down and give me purpose. And the purpose was to make sure I was always in the state of grace. One day, Barry was wandering around the house and something remarkable happened, something that changed his entire life. I went down to the basement where the equipment for the house was and an angel appeared to me who was my guardian angel. And we had a conversation just as if you and I were in the same room now. It was that real to me. Something about talking to the angels brought a sense of calm to Barry's frantic young mind. He started spending more and more time in the basement. I used to go down to the basement of our house because it was where I could be totally alone and be open to talking to my friends, my heavenly friends. And I was very anxious to get to heaven. Before long, the one angel had become several. Barry took to calling them the committee. And his conversations with the committee were a welcome reprieve from the conversations about religion that he was having at school. They had a very graphic example of what eternity was. And eternity was like a fly walking from the Santa Monica beach to Long Island in New York and taking one grain of sand. And when all the sand in California was carried to New York, uh, eternity would not have begun yet. Meeting the angels was a revelation for Barry. He was so excited to tell his aunt about it. I mean, after all, she was the one who had encouraged Barry to pursue his Catholic faith. But when he told her about the committee, suddenly she wasn't so supportive. She advised me not to talk to other people about my angels because it made me look crazy. In nursery school and kindergarten, I was trying to fit in with the other kids. So her counsel was, you know, just to keep it as a secret. And so she made it kind of like our little secret that we wouldn't tell anybody else. Driving my bike into the middle of that intersection was an attempt to go to heaven and get killed and go to heaven. So when that happened, I gave up on trying to get to heaven in a hurry and uh, realized I just had to go through life and live as good a life as I could. And God would reward me whenever it was time to go. So Barry found himself stuck between heaven and hell. He felt like he was constantly pinballing back and forth between the doors to both places. In his mind, Barry was doing everything he could to maintain a state of grace, taking communion at church and trying to convert as many of the kids in the neighborhood as he could to Catholicism. But Barry was worried. And that day on his bike, he was looking for a sure thing. And look, we really can't know what led Barry to believe that getting himself killed was his best option. But he did tell me that depression ran in his family. And on top of Barry's delusions, he started to suffer from his own bouts of depression. When I was depressed, I I could hardly ride my bike six blocks to grammar school. And then when I was manic, I was real up and industrious and got things done and got good grades in school. When I was depressed, I could hardly do anything. And my mother was also depressed and she was very also suicidal and tried a few times to kill herself while I was growing up. And uh, that always put me in the sort of shock. I honestly can't imagine having to deal with that kind of trauma, especially at such a young age. I do hope that if you were a kid nowadays, we would acknowledge it and get Barry and especially his mom some help. But back then in the 40s, that help didn't really exist. And these things were just not talked about. And that silence is the key to understanding the strategies Barry came up with to navigate the chaos and despair of his own childhood. And of course, the person that Barry grew up to be. I just thought that I was sort of cursed with this. So I just dealt with it with uh, being peaks and valleys. It wasn't until I was 14 that I discovered liquor. Our story continues after the break. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Well, BetterHelp is your answer. 
BetterHelp, here's what they do. They assess your needs and they match you with your own licensed professional therapist. How cool is that? And think about this. What if BetterHelp was around back in the old days when Barry Keenan was really searching for answers and really needed help? I mean, I think things would have gone a lot different for him in his life. And I bet we wouldn't be listening to this podcast right now, but that's okay. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. You can log on to your account anytime, anywhere, send a message to your counselor, and you'll get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, which is really great because then you don't have to sit in some weird, uncomfortable waiting room you know, that you usually have to do with traditional therapy. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sinatra. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer for the Grand Scheme listeners. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Sinatra. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Sinatra. Hey, you know a great time to slow down um, when you're on vacation? When you're on a beach somewhere, you're having a margarita, whatever it may be, in a little hammock, that's a good time to slow down. When you're in traffic, you know, slow down, just, you know, sort of focus. When you're meditating, perfect time to slow down. Now, let me tell you when a time to not slow down is. You don't want to slow down when you're working on financials for your business. And some financial systems, they just don't cut it. That is why you need NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite by Oracle is the number one financial system because NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, your inventory, HR, e-commerce, and much more. Failing to switch to NetSuite will leave you stuck trying to make sense of your books while your competitors, they just sprint right ahead of you. Get this, 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control since switching to NetSuite. Special financing is back. NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind financing program only for you and only for the ones who are ready to switch today. So head to netsuite.com slash Sinatra right now. That's special financing at netsuite.com slash S-I-N-A-T-R-A. netsuite.com slash S-I-N-A-T-R-A. And as Frank would say, go do it. Doobie, doobie, do it. When I think about the stories Barry tells about his childhood, I just can't get over that thing about his aunt telling him to be quiet about the angels, you know, to keep them a secret. She encouraged him to hide what ultimately was an obvious symptom of his mental illness. At the same time, she was telling Barry that the most important thing in life was to assimilate, to figure out who you need to be to fit in. Well, Barry got that message, loud and clear. So by the mid-50s, when he was a teenager, he was already struggling. But what makes Barry Barry is his relentless determination to maneuver his way back toward a state of grace. So here's this emotionally troubled kid, constantly trying to decipher the voices in his head, avoid eternal damnation, and navigate the slings and arrows of depression. He needed some sort of coping mechanism. And for Barry, it was making a plan. And, you know, it might not always be the best plan, like riding a bike into oncoming traffic, but it gives him some grounding, right? A foothold in the chaos. And when he gets to University High School in Santa Monica, or Uni High as it's commonly known, Barry figures out how to bloom where he's planted. I fit in real quickly with uh, some friends at Uni, which at the time was one of the highest rated public high schools in the country. And uh, so lots of celebrities' kids went there. And it was definitely a pre-college type of environment. And that's where I met Dean Torrance, my best friend, and uh, Nancy Sinatra and I were friends, which would become pertinent later on when I was trying to think of who I would kidnap. Now, since Barry just mentioned her, I should say that Nancy Sinatra had no interest in commenting on this story. And for what it's worth, she's gone on record by saying that she and Barry were not friends. But he and Dean Torrance sure were. Dean, remember, is the guy who first told me about Barry over funnel cakes at the state fair? As teenagers... Dean and Barry were trying to navigate the jet set at Uni High, and they quickly figured out the rules of the road. The most important thing at Uni High was to have a good car and to be dating a a nice-looking woman. Enter the Barons. It was a fraternity type of, you know, club, and one of the criteria for being a Baron is that you had to have a party at your house at least once every semester, so by the time everybody came around to their turn, we had a party every weekend to go to. And as the Barons become main characters in Barry's story, so does alcohol. Eventually, it will ruin his life, but in the moment, it saves the day. 
I lived for the weekends, drinking and playing poker on Friday nights, socializing on Saturday nights, partying. And then late Saturday nights, we'd do things like one of our big criminal enterprises in high school was that we would go garaging, as we called it, if people left their garage door open. We'd go in there and we'd take all their empty Coke bottles and what have you and take them to the store for redemption. Before long, Barry and the Barons started to up the ante on their pranks. We were always trying to outdo all the other kids in school, the other guys in other fraternities. And so we would uh, do crazy stunts, like uh, we would go to Highland Avenue in Hollywood and light palm trees on fire, then run up to Santa Monica Boulevard and light another palm tree. So the fire engines were putting out the fire at one palm tree. And we thought that was the funniest thing we ever saw just uh, because it caused commotion. It was bragging rights at school. I cringe as an adult, but as a teenager, we thought that was real funny. I was glad to hear Barry say he cringes when he thinks back on those pranks. I'm sure you cringed a little hearing about them yourself. You know, they probably got away with that stuff because they were rich, white, and privileged. And if they weren't, the story would have ended right then and there. But Barry didn't have that awareness yet. It's amazing the things that went on during that, that period of time, so clueless. At the time, he was just doing what he felt he had to do to fit in. And by his sophomore year, Barry was blooming. He had a crew, he had some social capital. He scraped together enough money to get a car, which he was keeping secret from his parents by parking it up the road from their house. And then, not long after his 15th birthday, Barry landed the missing piece in the Barron's formula for success. He got the girl. We had this big party, which included Nancy Sinatra and other attractive girls on my grade. Nancy came with some of her father's uh, albums, and and, uh, that's where I met the love of my life at that point. Shannon was her name. Shannon was a great athlete and very good-looking, natural redhead with green eyes. And um, we got along real good, and we went surfing together and did a lot of things. My mother had a second home up in Malibu, just near the pier. So Shannon and I would surf together, and we just did everything. We had lunch together at school and just basically hung out all the time. We were going to get married and, you know, all that stuff. And and she was um, my purpose for living. And at that time, I didn't have, a, there weren't voices in my head. There, and there, the committee was quiet. And uh, I just was living in an absolute blessed lifestyle. But then, just when Barry thought life couldn't get any better, it got unthinkably worse. I got called out of class at uni, and uh, my mother was in the principal's office, and I thought, oh my God, I wonder if we got caught for something. And uh, she said, that something terrible has happened. I got, I'm taking you home right now. And so she drove me home and my dad was there and I knew, boy, something was up. And I thought at that time I had a car that my parents didn't know I had. And I thought maybe they had found out about my car. And they, my dad blurted out that Shannon was dead. And I just immediately keeled over and uh, went into total depression. Shannon had been killed in a car accident, and Barry, who worked so hard to move past a childhood defined by secrets and fear, went into a tailspin. School became sort of a mechanical process, and uh, my dad told me he would give me a a new Corvette if I got a B average as a sort of a way to um, get me through the depression of losing Shannon. And so, sure enough, that's what I put my energies into, and I got a B-plus average and showed up with a brand-new 56 Corvette for, on my 16th birthday, which uh, only took me a, a six weeks to drive it off a cliff. Barry survived, but he was just barely clinging to stability. By all accounts, Barry should have been living an absolute charmed life. I mean, after all, most of us don't have the good fortune to receive a new Corvette in times of crisis. But all these blows were taking their toll. As if losing Shannon and driving off a cliff weren't enough, Barry's parents had divorced, and he was devastated. 
tack on the drinking and his mom's depression and the weight of keeping the committee a secret, Shannon had been more than just a girlfriend. She was a beacon, a shot at a future where Barry didn't have to pretend to be something he wasn't, where he could just be Barry. In spite of all that trauma, Barry did manage to graduate high school. And that summer, to try and lift his spirits, his mom invited him to come on a scuba diving trip to Mexico. She was traveling with her boyfriend, a guy named John Irwin. During their time south of the border, Barry and Irwin got very close. He was like an older brother type or uh, uncle. You know, we were very close. So one day, John and Barry are doing a dive. And Barry says they were looking for sunken treasure, which I wish I could tell you more about, but we don't have time. Anyway, there's Barry. He's swimming around looking for gold coins when all of a sudden the tube on his oxygen tank comes loose. We were in a, maybe 25 feet into this cave, and John, who was very strong, basically we exchanged breathing apparatus and pulled me out. And uh, he saved my life, so it was like, you know, when you save somebody's life, you've got that connection. Barry and John were close by now, but this really sealed the deal. Their stories were forever intertwined. Which is to say, you haven't heard the last of John Irwin in this thing. In the meantime, though, Barry figured two near-death experiences in a year were plenty. He didn't find any sunken treasure in that underwater cave, but not long after he got back to California, Barry struck gold. I was making the equivalent of about 40000 a month. All right, let's face it. Shopping for a car or home insurance is complicated. I mean, you could spend days looking up hundreds of providers or scrolling through thousands of policy options or spend a half hour on hold because you ask to talk to a human and then you finally get one and it's this over-friendly customer representative. I mean, there's one time I ended up talking to this dude for like 45 minutes. I mean, he was a cool guy, you know, Ed. I think his name was Ed. I didn't really tell him my name because, well, that, that part doesn't matter. It's still, it was hard to know if Ed was giving me the best price and coverage for my particular needs, see? And that's where the Zebra can help. With the Zebra, in just five minutes, you can compare quotes from every major insurance provider side by side for free, all from one independent marketplace. In other words, they do the shopping for you. And you don't have to talk to Ed. Although, again, nice guy, very nice guy. Shop car insurance without shopping around. Get all your options in one place for free by visiting thezebra.com slash Sinatra. That's thezebra.com slash Sinatra. Sorry. Now, I told you earlier that Barry's dad had money, and he made that money in the securities business. When Barry got back from Mexico, his dad started showing him the ropes. He'd give Barry leads, and then Barry would tell his friends, like Dean Torrance, to let Barry invest their money. Now, if that's making you scratch your chin a little, you're not alone. Barry told me about this. I asked him, I said, was this all above board? And he swears it was. Then again, you know where the store's headed, so even if it was illegal, Barry's not the kind of guy who would see that as a reason not to do it. At any rate, by 1962, he wasn't just doing it, he was crushing it. I was 22 years old. You know, I had two cars, two boats, and a motorcycle, you know, all the toys. And Barry wasn't the only one getting rich. He made a fortune for plenty of his friends and former barons, including Dean Torrance. Not that Dean really needed the dough, since Jan and Dean had a bunch of hit records by this point. And on top of that, Barry fell in love again, and he got engaged. He was pulling off the barons' equation once more. Nice car, pretty girl. Barry was back on top. But sadly, not for long. My fiancé and I were... uh coming from Orange County, where I had a house on Balboa Island, to uh, my mother's house. And uh, we were driving up Ohio Avenue, past the the backside of the Mormon Temple, and a little black dog darted out in the street. And it had been uh, drizzling, and the street was very slick. And when I swerved to miss the dog, I... uh, lost control of my car and fishtailed and what have you, and I ended up running into a retaining wall. And I went halfway through the windshield, and uh, I was knocked out for uh, maybe a minute or so. 
I ended up going to the ER and was diagnosed with a concussion and and uh, lots of lacerations and what have you. And I was in chronic back and neck and head pain. By this time, Barry had been using alcohol as a coping mechanism for his mental issues for years. And in the aftermath of the crash, a dangerous new element entered the picture, pills. The doctors prescribed Percodan, uh, pain medication, and tranquilizer so I wouldn't be so uptight all the time, and sleeping pills so I could go to sleep, and then wake up pills to get through the day. Before long, the very thing that was supposed to alleviate Barry's pain ended up making it exponentially worse. In about six months' time, I had become a complete drug addict and was unable to hold a job and uh, couldn't think straight. Barry's fiance survived the wreck, but their engagement did not. She left Barry, and Barry started to spiral. I just sat around and uh, drank and took narcotic drugs and uh, basically became unemployable. But during that time, I got married in Las Vegas to a very attractive young lady named Donna. It probably won't surprise you to learn that Barry and Donna's marriage didn't last. Barry admits he wasn't much of a husband. He was much more focused on other interests at the time. Quaaludes and amphetamines and tranquilizers and sleeping pills. But Barry was determined to pull himself back from the brink. I knew I didn't want to be a drug addict all the rest of my life and an alcoholic. So I was trying to think of some way I could make money and I'd gone completely broke, lost my wife, lost my house, lost my cars, lost my boats, lost everything, including my dog. If all of this isn't feeling sufficiently Job-like for you, Barry's life wasn't the only one going off the rails. My dad had fallen on very hard times and was running into cars and stuff like that, sideswiping cars. My mother had, was recovering from her latest suicide attempt. Everything sort of turned bad at the same time. In a few short months, Barry's life had gone from California dream to California nightmare. And this is the moment that I told you about at the top of the show, the moment where Barry has this thought that I'm willing to bet that you've had once or twice. I know I have. If I could just make one big hit, everything would be okay. That would cure everything. Barry felt like everything was broken, and it was his job to fix it. I can help my dad get his company back up and going, can help my mom and my aunt, who are chronically depressed by this time. And I thought if they uh, saw me doing well, I thought would help them out of their depression. That's the headspace that Barry was in one afternoon when he decided to take a drive up into the hills. I parked my car on this bluff overlooking Catalina Island where I used to go and with my wife and we would have drinks in the car watching the sunset. And this particular day I was by myself and I was trying to figure out how I was going to get out of my financial uh, dilemma. So I was sitting on the bluff trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do and I was sipping my drinks and taking my pills. And then... Sitting on that bluff in the clear autumn evening, Barry Keenan got the miracle he was hoping for. All of a sudden, God's voice came over my car radio. Now the radio was off. Now listen, I know how this sounds, okay? In any other story, this moment is totally contrived. Divine intervention. God, quite literally, in the machine. But this isn't any old story. No, this is Barry Keenan's story. And this moment isn't so different from the first angelic visitation Barry experienced as a young boy in his mom's basement. Only this time, it wasn't just any heavenly messenger paying Barry a visit, no. This time, it was the man himself. To me, it was actually happening, uh, as sure as you and I are here in this interview, it, to me it was as real as real life. God came and was talking to me and said, well, uh, and we discussed, well, robbing a bank or robbing a grocery store or something like that wasn't going to raise the kind of money that I needed to pull this thing off. Barry actually had this number ready. He calculated that he needed 240000 to save himself and to save his family. So uh, God said, well, the, uh, given the amount of money that you need to raise, the only thing that I can suggest to you if you think about kidnapping somebody. 
that was all Barry Keenan needed to hear. For the first time in seven months since the wreck, I felt energized. So I went down to the Jolly Roger restaurant on Catalina Island and started writing my business plan out. Next time on the grand scheme snatching Sinatra, God gives Barry a set of rules for his kidnapping scheme. Couldn't be a girl, couldn't be a baby, too much opportunity for injury to the baby. It had to be done quickly so the parents wouldn't be uh, tormented by missing their child. And uh, I had to pay the money back to expunge the technical sin of stealing. And I said, now, Dean, don't interrupt me until I finish. So I got out my binder, and he looked at it like, what is this? Boy, you don't want to miss that episode. You'll get it for free wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also binge the entire series right now, early and ad-free, by subscribing to Wondery Plus. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. The Grand Scheme, Snatching Sinatra, is based on a true story as recollected and retold by my friend Barry Keenan. Certain names and details have been changed to protect the identity of those involved. The show is produced by Wondery in partnership with Spoke Media. Written by Sam Dingman and produced by Jenna Burnett with Lucy Wong and Kristen Bennett. Research and dramaturgy by Haley Nelson. Alicia Force is our coordinating producer. Our executive producers are Jean-Yel Kastner, Patrick Couday, Aliyah Tavakolian, and Keith Reynolds. Sound design and mix by NPAL Audio. Original music by Mike Bennett, Michael Gigante, and Matt Beckley. Additional music from First Com and Epidemic Sound. Special thanks to Will Short, Evan Arnett, Carson McCain, Caroline Hamilton, Kelly Kolf, and of course, the one and only Barry Keenan. I'm John Stamos. Thank you for listening. Listening.